My guest is Laura Orleans. She's the director of the New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center, and they're hosting a program later this month in the auditorium at the National uh, Whaling Historic Park in New Bedford on a subject that many in the city have until now been reluctant to talk about. I'm speaking of the 1985-86 fisherman strike. And uh, first of all, welcome, Laura. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, this event is on the 17th. Why did the Heritage Center uh, choose to take a strike on as a subject for <laughs> a kind of a community conversation? That's a good question. Um, so I've been working with the fishing community for the better part of, gosh, nearly 20 years at this point. And when I learned about that particular strike, I gather there were many strikes mm. along the years, but that one um, really was a watershed moment for the community and really changed everything. And so it just seemed like something important to know about. And, you know, 10 or 15 years ago when I started asking questions, people were very reluctant to talk. It was a very, very bitter strike. Um, there are scars that are still, you know, deep um, in the community. But it, it also, as I said, was um, it was like a watershed moment for the community. And it just seems um, important to document that history. Uh, when I first came to New Bedford, a lot of the projects that I did were focused on the whaling history and trying to capture stories, untold stories, from the whaling community. Um, and it was often very frustrating because it was so distant in people's memories and personal experiences. I did get to interview a 102-year-old man, Antonio Lopes, who had actually gone whaling, and that was tremendous. But, you know, this is history that's 30, 35 years ago. So there are plenty of people who lived it. Give us details on when the event will be and all of that. Sure. So, as you said, it's at the National Park Theater, and that's, for anybody who doesn't know, located at 33, Beth, uh, sorry, 33 William Street, um, right around the corner from uh, the, the Fishing Heritage Center. And they have a 55-seat theater, so um, we're expecting a good crowd. I would suggest getting there early. The event begins at 7. The doors, I believe, open at 6.30, um, and it's free of charge. That's... Good. That, that's a good start right there. Um, so I was going to ask you why are people so reluctant to speak about the strike? You've kind of referenced that a couple of times here. Um, my thought is that, as you suggested, it was a watershed moment. It changed the way the fishing industry does business in New Bedford. There were a lot of things around that, too, that I think people don't. May, may forget about 1975-76, the 200-mile fishing limit was signed and into law. And there was a, a lot of celebration over that law. We had Russian ships, Russian trawlers, big Russian trawlers, taking a lot of fish 15, 20 miles off the shore of the United States before that law. That law ended that and opened those waters really to... Uh, U.S. fishermen. Now, they were always open to U.S. fishermen, but the Russians were always taking a lot of fish. So we had kind of a maybe seven or eight year run there where we were kings of uh, the ocean, <laughs> at least our part of the ocean, 200 miles out. Uh, but things started to change, I think, in the late, or early 80s. Fishing... There was not was not was not really uh, uh, quite as profitable as it was after the two hundred mile limit. We took a lot of fish. People took a lot of fish. There are a number of things that that yeah. happened. Um, there was an effort to really rebuild or build up the domestic more fleet. regulation. Well, so first there was uh, just a explosion of new boats, right? Big boats yeah. um, in in the domestic fleet. There also was an energy crisis going on. So if you remember, gas prices were going up and up and up from sort of 76 on. So by the time you hit 1980, um, gas prices were through the roof and fish prices were dropping. And Because there was more fish being caught. Yeah. And yeah. so um, that was challenging. There was actually another event that happened in 1980. It wasn't actually a strike, but it was a tie-up that happened around fishermen protesting the low prices that they were getting for fish. And they marched on City Hall. We'll, we'll be showing a few images from that mm -hmm. time as well. So um, by the time 1985 came around, uh, I think that boat owners started to realize, hey, this isn't quite what we thought it was going to be. We've got to cut some costs here. And I think that was the impetus. 
for uh, some tough negotiations and then the strike. Um, am I off base? No, I think you're correct. There were also, as I understand, it was a, um, a change in union leadership that um, precipitated some things. So I believe the Teamsters were in control of the union initially, and then the SIU came in right around um, sometime early in 1985. Um, and it was partly their um, desire to to see fishermen have you know better wages and what whatnot. Um, and to be honest, we're at the beginning stages of exploring this history. We've been doing some interviews. We have um, an amazing graduate student who's working with us who's been doing a lot of archival work. So we've been, she has been mining um, the Mm -hmm. Standard Times archives and looking at, you know, back issues of the Standard Times, the Advocate, the Barnacle. Um, You actually were kind enough to lead us to some uh, television um, footage from New Center 13, uh, we recently put our hands on some um, radio, uh, audio, um, live audio coverage from Gary Golis, actually, mm-hmm. who was at WNBH. Right. So there's a lot, you know, it's it's exciting and terrifying in some ways. <laughs> um, but it's very interesting to be able to talk to people. We've actually now talked to three journalists who were instrumental in covering that um, that event or those events. Um, and then, you know, we're beginning to talk to lawyers and elected officials and fishermen and boat owners and you name it. Um, you know, so, and part of what we want to do with this event is inspire more people to come forward with stories and photographs and anything they might have that would be of interest. I can tell you, uh, going down on the waterfront at uh, 7.30 a.m. or 7 a.m. those days, it was an interesting trip because there were just a lot of people who were upset, angry. There were trash cans, uh, you know, on fire, so guys could keep warm in those late, uh, those December days, November days, January days. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, you you never quite knew what you were going to see. There was no script for anything down there. So uh, it was uh, an interesting uh, story to cover, but it kind of uh, ended, I think, these are my words, not anybody else's. It kind of ended in a whimper mm. because boat owners, when the weather broke in February, March, uh, they wanted to go back. They wanted to get, get you know, I, I'm not making any money sitting on the dock here. And fishermen went on board. They, they, they had, and because they had bills to pay too. True. And I think also people may not realize, but not every boat was a union boat. So there were boats that were not part of the fishermen's union that did not participate in the strike. So they were continuing to fish. Um, the other thing that happened is that the auction effectively shut down. So from 1980, uh, I'm sorry, 1941 until 1985, we had what was called a public auction located in that brick building, the Warfinger yeah, building. A bit of New Bedford history there, clearly. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, with the strike... That auction shut down, um, and then eventually the dealers, the the um, fish you know fish processing plant owners, sure. started their own auction, um, and so they kind of took the auction elsewhere, so that boats had a place you know boats that were fishing had a place to sell their catch. And that auction still exists today. Well, no. Then it went through a number of different oh, okay. incarnations. So no, that's okay. Um, so for a, a period of time, there was an auction that happened in this Yellow Bird building, is what I've been told. Yes. Um, I remember that. There was also a point, um, and I don't know all of the history, um, but there was an auction that took place under the overpass for a little while. There was an auction that took place out of a trailer on Pier 3. There were a lot of different things that sort of happened. And then, I believe it was in 1994, um, the Canastra Brothers started what we now have, which is a privately owned display auction. Very different way of selling fish. Um, So back in the, you know, in the Warfinger days, it was sight unseen. You had to buy the entire catch from a boat. So, you know, that boat might come in with cod, haddock, flounder, and maybe you had a market for the flatfish, but you didn't really have a market for the haddock. You had to buy the whole boat. You had to figure out a way to sell it. And you bought essentially on the reputation of the skipper. Um, You know, you didn't inspect the product. Now it's called a display auction because all of the product is on display in the wee hours of the morning, and buyers send representatives down who walk around with a clipboard and a grading sheet, and they actually... You know, give a, assign a letter grade to the freshness and the quality of the product. Call back to New York or wherever it is that the the buyer is based, and that's how the bidding takes place. You're jarring even my memory, Laura. <laughs> You're listening to Town Square Sunday. I'm Jim Phillips. My host is Laura Orleans of the New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center. 
She's here to uh, talk about an event that will be held November 17th at the National Park Auditorium at 7 p.m. Doors open at 6.30 regarding the 1985-86 fisherman strike in New Bedford. Who will be some of the players who will take part in this discussion on the 17th? Um, well, we're hoping really that people like yourself yeah. <laughs> and oh, others. Um, I mean, there. we haven't, we don't have a panel, so to speak. What we're planning to do is really to present um, present people with an audio visual collage montage. So they will hear some of these radio recordings. They will see some of the footage that you actually were responsible for. They will see some images that were um, in local newspapers that Spinner Publications has um, archived. Um, thankfully. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the, the thought is that we'll present this stuff. I would think it would be pre- pretty evocative. It's, it's evocative to me, and I didn't live in New Bedford at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think for people who lived it, hopefully they will be flooded with memories. And so we'll pull, you know, bring the lights up and, and see what kinds of things people want to share at that moment. Um, we also will have forms for people to fill out just giving us their contact information and letting us know, yes, I, you know, I lived through that and I'd like to share my story. And then we'll follow up with um, an opportunity to, you know, to interview. Yeah. Or So this project will not be over. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, is, no, no. This is just one step in the project, right? This is just one step. And in fact, um, our intent, uh, as I said, there were many strikes along the way. And up until 1985-86, pretty much every aspect of the waterfront was unionized. So you had um, a seafood workers union. That was people who worked in the fish houses cutting fish or packing it. You had a lumpers union. That was people who offload the catch. Um, you ha- obviously had the fishermen's union. Um, today, we really have the longshoremen's union as the strong union that's still in place. So that's really the, you know, the folks that offload cargo, not right. so much in the fishing industry. But our intent is to look at all of those groups and all of those stories over the next... Um, between now and, say, May or June. Um, of what year? Of, of next year. <laughs> <laughs> and we have been already uh, working at this for, you know, for several months. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot, a lot to be done, and I think you can look forward, hopefully, to a, a community conversation that looks at uh, the 1983 uh, seafood workers' strike and the 1978 lumpers' strike. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's not – I mean, we – the, the center and before that the Working Waterfront Festival have f- uh, focused really on trying to bring um, bring the story of the fishing industry out to the public, give the fishing community an opportunity to tell that story. And we're not changing that, uh, but this, this history is a little more fraught, let's say. And we're going to see, as you mentioned, some pictures and video of the strike and of uh, maybe some... Uh it never se- we never seemed to be uh, able to catch. Uh, there was no lack of people willing to talk to us. Let's say let's put let's put it that way. But um, the boat owners uh, were reluctant to kind of tip their hand. I think I think that that's a feeling I have about mm-hmm. it. And, uh, and and the fishermen um, they just wanted to make more money. As the prices, like you said, gas, fuel, food, all the prices going up, um, when they get out, when they get their paycheck at the end of a trip, it was minuscule. Sometimes you owed. Yes. Based on the cost of the trip, you know? And then, to be fair, I think, you know, as you were saying, at that time, it wasn't like the boat owners were raking in the money either. You know, there was a lot of cost that was assessed to them. Uh, the price of insurance, I think, I can't remember the figure, but it went up by many, many fold. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that was something that, that the boat owners needed to cover. So, By early in the 86, uh, we mentioned the strike was over, or it seemed to be over. There was still some negotiations going on, but the weather was breaking. Boat owners basically said it's time to fish. And the fishermen, uh, faced with working or having no income, some chose to work. And then, of course, there were some non-union boats who just went out as scheduled. Mm-hmm. Um, do we have any idea how many, how many uh, maybe fishermen tried to stand fast there or? No, probably not. I, I, yeah, I have to say I don't. Um, I do know from reading an article that was in the Standard Times, I want to say in sometime in the month of January mm-hmm. in 1986, um, John Linehan, who's no longer with us, was interviewed. And he actually remembered back to the 50s at a time when all the boats, in his memory, were unionized. You know, there was a much more sort of cohesive port, I think, at that yeah. time. And yeah. 
those strikes, and I've heard this from others, that those earlier strikes were sort of more civilized. <laughs> and, um, you know, they were firm negotiations, but they weren't as um, divisive and bitter as, as they became. It's because, uh, because there wasn't quite the cohesiveness here. Uh, it seemed like, uh, well, as you said, uh, you know, maybe a little less civilized. We know there were shots fired. We know that. And uh, rocks know, thrown, rocks thrown, and uh, maybe a little more. Who knows? Mm. But yeah, it wasn't. It, it wasn't a, a real. Uh, it was a labor strike in perhaps the older sense of the word. You know, I mean, some of these people weren't kidding. It was not a joke. The other thing, too, that um, some people have pointed out is if you look at the national context, um, this was also during the Reagan years, and it mm -hmm. was during a time when the um, FAA um, strike had sure took right. place, or stri stri uh, the, when the, the union air controllers exactly uh, yeah yeah and so they had uh, so Reagan had essentially busted that union, and uh, I, I think probably a lot of managers were uh, feeling that. Uh, Maybe we, maybe we can do something like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a changing time. There's no question about it. With increased regulation, higher prices, Reagan and the air traffic controllers. I mean, it was a, a time when uh, folks may have tried to dismiss uh, labor unions. And I think we saw that all through the 80s mm -hmm. here. And it was just a – not only were union – the fishermen's union, uh, the SIU, uh, busted, so to speak – but also we had a lot of unions here uh, go down with the closing of factories mm -hmm. during the 80s. It was not a pleasant time. Um, is there going to be a permanent display at the Heritage Center for this issue um, at so some the, point? Yeah, the funding that we received to do this project is from the National Endowment for the Humanities and, par, par, and the Mass Humanities, which is the state, um, state agency. And what we, um, what we will come out of in this project is an archive, a you know, huge archive of uh, oral histories and, and um, photographs and all of that, but also a plan for an exhibit. So this would be a major exhibit, um, and and so we'll have a plan for an exhibit, and then we would need to raise more money in order to mount an right, One more exhibit. time. Give us a rundown of the event, the sure, date, the course. time, the place. So we're calling the event Remembering the Fisherman Strike of 1985-86. takes place on Friday, November 17th. begins at 7 p.m., um, and it takes place at the National Park Theater, which for anyone who doesn't know is located at 33 William Street in downtown New Bedford. Um, parking at that hour is unrestricted on the streets, so you can park, you know, meters are not in, in operation. It's right down the street from the Elm Street garage. Um, I find lately when I go downtown at night, it's hard to find parking, so I would suggest getting there reasonably early, and that's a good thing. That means that New Bedford is lively and there's a lot going on. We've got to sneak in some discussion here about John Ryan. Yes. John Ryan... And we, we should call him by his nickname because on the waterfront, my understanding is if you don't use the nickname, sometimes people have no idea who you're <laughs> talking about. <laughs> so he was John Choo Choo Ryan. Um, he retired from a career on, on uh, working for Amtrak, so he was an engineer. Um, and he, uh, all throughout his life, but particularly in his retirement, was fascinated with photography. Um, actually, he had done, he was also a commercial diver and had started out photographing for um, insurance companies when there was an issue and then became really interested in the lines of the boats and the boats themselves. And so he stood on the hurricane dike and took photographs of every boat going in and out of the harbor for a good 20 years or so, um, mm -hmm. producing, oh, say 10,000 slides, negatives, and prints. And when he passed away, um, his daughter eventually gave that collection to Phil Mello. Phil has been our uh, stalwart board chairman, and Phil thought that they should reside at the Fishing Heritage Center. So we are in a um, big archival project here, um, scanning all of those images to create a, a searchable database. Uh, but we are opening an exhibit on Thursday. Well, the exhibit will have have opened. <laughs> um, the exhibit will be up in our gallery space um, through January 28th, and um, we're not putting up all 10,000 images. That would be a bit much. <laughs> uh, we've picked 50 or so um, that are going to be up in frames, and then we actually have a digital photo frame that will cycle through about 5,000 scanned images. So people should um, come, and I think you'll um, get a chance to see, you know, if you 
have any history in this fleet, you'll get a chance to see boats that are no longer here. A lot of these boats were scrapped. Some of them are old wooden boats, a lot of eastern rigs. Um, some of them are boats that are still fishing. But, um, you know, what I find interesting is, to me, to the untrained eye, they, they all look like boats. But for people who've been around a while, they can stand from a distance and look at a boat or look at a photograph of a boat and they know exactly who it is, w which boat it is, um, without looking at the name. You know, I'd have to zoom in to look at the name, but um, the lines on these boats and the way they're rigged and the colors and all of that is a, a giveaway for folks who know. Thanks again to uh, Laura Orleans for coming in here. Laura, every time you, you're a showstopper when you come here. <laughs> Wealth well, of information. We, I really appreciate you taking an interest in the things that we're doing. And, and um, you'll be there on the 17th That's to right, share I your perspective. I mentioned that I'll see you on the 17th at the National Park Auditorium. A uh, special program about the fisherman strike, 85, 86, 7 o'clock. And I should say that we have also that this program is being co-sponsored by the Labor Education Center at UMass Dartmouth, as well as Spinner Publications. Uh, both of those organizations are helping us with this project. Sure.